Okay, everyone, good afternoon and welcome to our law stream. And good welcome to everyone. Good welcome, that's not a good start. Good afternoon to everybody on the online stream as well. Um, I prepared a very witty and funny introduction, but I'm aware that we're over five minutes late. So I will, with no further ado, introduce Alex Smith, who is the Innovation Manager at Reed Smith, and Chloe Moore, who I've probably just mullered the pronunciation of the <laughs> uh, who is a Grad Recruitment Advisor, also at Reed Smith. And they're going to talk about the skills that legal employers are looking for and the skills gap that exists. Take it away. Okay. Great. We'll just introduce ourselves, give a bit of background, um, and then we'll jump into just talking about how Chloe and I have started working over the last 15 months or so and some of the results we're getting and some of the skills we're seeing coming through. So my name's Alex Smith. I'm Innovation Manager at Reed Smith. Too many Smiths going on there. Um, and my background um, was I was uh, 17 years before this at LexisNexis building digital products. So I put stuff onto the internet in 1999 and started building all these various online products that you use. Um, and I'm responsible for various things which you may not like, like bits of, bits of certain products. Um, um, but then I switched over to Reed Smith about 15 months or so ago um, to take over this role which often gets put into um, inverted commas called Innovation Manager. Um, and so I've been kind of working through what that means. One of the key areas that I've been working through in the last 15 months has been working with Chloe. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Um, so I'm Chloe Mio. I look after the graduate recruitment team at Reed Smith. I recognise a couple of people here, which is nice to see as well. Um, so I look after everything recruitment related, so manage the training contracts um, and have been working, as Alex has said, quite closely on the link of recruiting trainees and what new skills we might be looking for and the ways the role might change in future and how we might want to start thinking of that now. Um, particularly, obviously, with law firms, which I'm sure you're all aware, we recruit two years ahead. So if we want to start making any change, there's quite a lot of lead time to actually get that to happen. So um, we're, we're really looking at, as into, at the way, into um, the ways in which we might want to change the typical role of a trainee and, uh, and what that involves. So that's a bit of background on my role, and I've been at the firm as well for three years, so I'm um, happy to answer any questions just generally also. Um, it'll be really useful just to understand actually a bit about all of you sitting here in terms of backgrounds. I'm guessing you're all, are you all at BPP? Yeah. Great. And um, how many of you studied law? Just a show of hands. How many non-law? And anyone from more of a STEM background, so science, any sort of different type of backgrounds like that? Oh, yeah, no, we've met actually before, haven't we, as well? Great. Anyone else from a STEM type background? Yeah, over there as well? Great, it's really interesting. Uh, and I think there's, there's definitely been a historical view that um, previously a lot of law students would go into the profession or certain disciplines outside of law, such as history, psychology, classics, and a number of other, another, a number of other um, type of disciplines. But there's not really been as much of a focus on math students or economics or, philosophy or, or um, psychology and, uh, and the like. So that, that's definitely something Alex and I have been looking at at the moment and what different types of skills can actually be, be used in, in the role of a lawyer um, and where the sort of shortage is. So that, that's a bit of background. Yeah, thanks. Um, so what we're going to talk through is about, we've got about 10 slides or so, um, we're basically talking a bit of a journey that we've been on over the last 15 months, so it sounds a bit like the X Factor, doesn't it, we've all been on a bit of a journey, um, but what we're actually seeing is the way that we have, the way that I have come in to try and do things slightly differently with my kind of digital product background, the way that Chloe has been trying to change the kind of the way we recruit and obviously that two year process and looking ahead to what skills we may need as we get to a, um, a digital law firm. Um, but we have kind of changed and we keep on changing all the time what we do. So we have some successful events and then we have some, have some not so successful events and we kind of learn and we move and we kind of change the dial a little bit. Um, we've also, because of some of the things that we've done, Chloe's changed some of the way that she does certain things and we'll talk a little bit about how we've got people away from necessarily always sitting at a desk and actually getting into more teamwork exercises uh, and that's important because we'll, we'll show you some of the pieces we, we, we're coming on to. But um, the first thing I want to say is when you start thinking digital, I think um, what my, my take on what happened by putting the, the internet is in about 1999, we put old metaphors online. And so actually what we created was the old metaphors online. So the one that I used to work on was something called books on screen. It's, it's books on screen. 
Um, and actually, what we didn't really think about at that time was how do we actually change people to be more digital? And obviously, um, certain organizations, the last speaker was just talking about, have, um, like Facebook and Google have actually changed the game. And they were the, they were the game changers because they basically came in and said, let's think solely digitally. None of this kind of legacy, none of this what did we used to do in the past, et cetera. So actually, when you come and say, well, what do we mean by digital lawyers or electronic lawyers or whatever it might be, um, it's about new skills and it's about a slightly different mindset. It's a kind of more collaborative, um, creative mindset than necessarily in the past. So we're having to really think about those um, skills and, and, and those, um, um, that mindset. Yeah, do you want absolutely. And ju just thinking about what a lawyer needs to have, I mean, you'd all have... I'm sure, a, a good idea of what, what most law firms are sticking on their website as sort of key, key skills, but can anyone just shout out key things that are normally associated with the role of a lawyer? <coughs> Commercial awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Analytical. Definitely, yeah. What was that, sorry? Skills. Yeah, absolutely. Anything more on the technical side as well? Absolutely. All of them are spot on. You know, attention to detail, really, really key. Analytical was mentioned. Communication, thinking outside the box, think problem solving. There's so many different skills and the list could go on that's needed. It's not just a couple of things. And if you're only looking at law or looking at certain disciplines, there will completely just be a gap in terms of the people we're recruiting, um, particularly if we're not actually making an effort to go and attract people from different backgrounds. Um, I mean, Alex can talk a bit about the innovation hub we've now got at the firm, and that's, I think we were one of the first firms to create an innovation space which people can use internally but also externally. So we've brought students in, and a couple of you may have been to the firm, to our innovation hub also. Um, and just in terms of the recruitment, so I speak quite often to a lot of the partners and people on the training contracted panel, and just really speak to them around... Is there, any, is, is there any gaps or any skill shortages from our trainees? Is there anything that you'd like to see more of? And probably not too surprisingly, our, um, what we call our practice group leaders, so the head of our finance department, said, actually, I'd love to see some math students come through, or economics, or, or other type of students, science as well, um, which is quite interesting, because I think often people might not necessarily associate science automatically with law. Um, but there's, there's a huge drive, and I mean, obviously, if you've got a, 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 even a sort of prior work experience in a different industry, there's so many benefits of being able to bring that to law and, and, and the different skills you get. Um, and we've now, so, so we've tried to focus, particularly over the last, as Alex said, I'd say year in particular, mm. at actually going out and recruiting these other types of students. So we've done... A, re a really successful event actually with Legal Cheek around STEM students, which we did in the Innovation Hub, and actually making sure that students knew that actually we want to see different types of backgrounds. Um, and it's great, you know, if people are a bit more mature and have other work experience to use. I mean, that, that's just amazing, um, rather than just going for the same type of students all the time. And um, we've now seen, so actually doing a lot of the promotion around it and actually coming to events and meeting different students from different type of backgrounds, we're now starting to see people come through the interview process, which is then fascinating to see how different people respond in terms of the answers they draw upon and, and their examples. So we're, we're currently recruiting at the moment, and we've interviewed now, um, we've, we've got an interview next week, our first ever computer science grad who's coming in um, next week to interview. We've interviewed, I interviewed an economics student um, a few weeks back, science, um, we've had a, a, a big mix. And it's been really interesting, the different examples they've drawn upon and the different way they're thinking. And we'll talk a bit more around the diversity of thought, but it's so important. And I mean, attention to detail is something you'll always hear throughout your training contract if you do decide to go into law or, or the legal sector. It's, it's so key. And examples from math students or economic students, when they're very technical, very number focused, some of the examples they've, they've provided are just, to be honest, outstanding. And, and I was quite shocked, actually, to see some of the, some of the different things that they drew upon from their, from their background. So it's been really interesting and quite fascinating um, to see some different diverse students coming through. And we're seeing, um, I think there's a couple of things to look at um, in when you, someone said commerciality. So commerciality is very, very key, absolutely, will always be, because that's what law firms, commercial law firms give. 
But increasingly, there are two movements in the more corporate field that you really need to have an eye on. One is corporates are becoming more data driven. So instead of having opinion on the board level, it's opinion based on a lot of data, mm. a lot of data reporting, analytics, etc. And if you don't talk that language, you're coming in and saying, my advice is, because I've been a lawyer for a long time, isn't going to wash because someone's going to start to say, I need the data. Where's the data? Can you show me that? Um, and then the other main revolution that's kind of happening at the moment, largely because of digital and, 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 and truly going, most of the economy truly finally going digital, it's taken a very long time to get to this point, not just put books on screen, um, is actually a lot of organisations are going agile. So the agile development, I don't mean agile as in work from home, I mean the agile development methodology. And that methodology is about self-contained teams building things in small increments, um, basically releasing software, testing it, changing, pivoting, moving around. But those teams are self-sufficient. Yeah, and they're not under hierarchies, etc. The goal of a Scrum Agile team is to be your own mini CEO in a large corporate. And so basically they're starting to bring in these principles. And these principles really are about teamwork. Um, so diversity of thought is a really, really key one in those teams of having different people with different skills, whether it's a deep level coder, a front end coder, a UX person, a product manager, a business manager, whoever, everyone's in that room and everyone is making those decisions like that. None of this, this will wait, this is a project for two years or whatever it might be. And when you get that, you realize that you have to have this diversity of thought. Um, and that's something that we need to bring in. It's slightly different. We're not, I am developing software, but that's a slightly different area. But actually in how we do run projects for our clients, et cetera, having that diversity of thought and um, diversity of different viewpoints um, is absolutely critical. So we've done a lot of these sessions and they're really interesting watching. We do these sessions, um, you stand in, you get, you get a challenge, you get into a hub, you kind of have to think it through, problem solving, we give you a few clues, some service design stuff. But what we can see is really interesting, the observations we've seen of people and how they interact and how the extrovert starts off and then you're kind of watching the introvert actually thinking through the problem and what, when are they going to interject and when are they going to come into this team. And it's important to have that kind of diversity. Mm, completely agree. Okay. Um, and that kind of moves on from that, you know, increasingly in law firms, solving legal problems is not going to be 10 lawyers getting together and solving it. What you're going to have is four or five lawyers, you're going to have a statistical an analyst, you're going to have an economist, you're going to have an um, analytical person, you might even have a coder or you might have a um, legal engineer in the room and those people will be working in teams together. So even uh, law firms have this funny one, I am a non-lawyer. That's what I'm called in the industry um, because I'm, I like to think I'm a business professional, but a lot of the time you get called a non-lawyer. Um, but increasingly you are going to end up in these teams where actually the data scientist is working with the lawyer to think through the model of how we're going to go back to the client, where is the issues in that, in that set of M&A documents that's really at, at risk. And people are going to have to get used to that way of working in multifunctional teams and really appreciating the skills that other people bring, the non-lawyers bring to, to, to that game and finding a way to work in those and often having taking your experience you've had doing something else in, into that so it's not going to be a load of lawyers in a room with some books it's going to be multifunctional teams and finding the way of working in teams is going to be absolutely critical. Yeah agreed and a lot of you would have heard about the whole clients want more for less type of thing that's that's often said now which is true in the whole added value what else can you bring you know if you go and pitch what can you provide that another law firm out there can't already provide as well also. So the innovation side is really key because if you don't look at that at all, you're just behind automatically um, in a number of ways. So we get asked now often enough, I mean, I, I'm also a non-lawyer and I'm obviously in the, in the recruitment side, but when it comes to clients, I engage with a number of clients and we will do joint recruitment events, for example, and clients actually really like that, particularly we focus a lot on diversity, we do stuff around innovation, which also our clients do, so clients like to collaborate. Innovation's even more so important because clients want to know what's out there, you know, who's doing what. Is there any products that we can help and support clients with? Can we make their life easier? Is there anything that they could be doing internally? that there's also this sort of, yeah. a, a little bit of a battle a, and a, a slight conflict whether we should be advising clients <laughs> on how to do something themselves or trying to find a cheaper way for them to do something because it's a bit like, well, isn't that what we're looking to do ourselves so we can earn money? Um, but also, you know, in terms of strengthening the relationship, 
that can be really key for when other things and bigger matters and or projects come up. So it's really close to stay close to yeah. your, it's really important, sorry, to stay close to your clients and really understand their needs and how you can support them. Because if you do that and can you show you can do that effectively, that trust that you build and that relationship goes, you know, foot very deep. And we've seen a number yeah. of examples and Alex recently now has been swamped with clients wanting to engage with the innovation hub and see how they can be doing things differently internally. And I know they've been doing a lot of mapping up yeah. Problems. So we did. We, I, I, I run GC forums now, trying to find out what GCs want, because all the hype is one thing, but we actually need to know what they want. We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, we run sessions now with um, the legal teams of various of our clients, but we also then bring in their business services people. We're building their sales people, and we map out how their sales and business people all interact on getting something done, like a contract or a sales agreement. Um, and then we kind of think about how we could either improve the service, which is the first thing. It's still a human business. I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Um, but then we look at how we improve the processes and how we collaborate more. And then we look at are there any technologies that come in. Our actual mantra in the Innovation Hub is people, process, and then technology. I think most start with technology and try and put the other two bits in later. Um, but one of the main things I wanted to say is, this is the next one. Um, a lot of the stuff when you look at digital products, everyone gets very, very obsessed about the technology. They go, some AI, fantastic, there's a big, nice, flashy dashboard, oh, there's a search, whatever it might be. Um, the main movement over the last, um, how would I describe it, last three or four years has been to something called service design and user-centric design. So that's actually designing the product not on what's cool, but actually on what people want. Um, so I can, I can talk about many different projects across society that have spent a vast amount of money and have failed. The NHS project around digital records was an absolute failure because they never spoke to any doctors about how they were going to use the system. So strangely, when the system launched, they hadn't spoken to anyone and no one wanted to use it. So actually, what, we've, what we're really seeing, and this is coming through, we're seeing a lot of this in the banks, in the insurance, um, any industry that's actually digitizing now or, or re innovating, you'll see a lot more money going into banks and into law and innovation. Um, all of it's around human-centered design. So it's about understanding humans, understanding how they work, what's in their mind, and what they are trying to achieve. And that's a really, really interesting thing to do. Um, I'm doing the Law Without Walls thing at the moment, and um, we've got a very, very sensitive project, and the, our students were really, really like, how are we going to ask these people that? And I just said, be human, ask open questions listen, empathise. Empathise is a really, really key um, thing to have. We, we, we did our GC forum, and that's one of our top five things that came out about what GCs want, empathy from their law firm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then we get into like our problem solving. So, so one of the things we, we are trying to do now is not try and jump to the solution too early. I know that sounds really, really weird, because you've probably got some great ideas of how to solve something. But actually really understanding the problem means you don't make mistakes. Looking at different ways to solve a problem. There are many different ways to solve a problem, not one. Um, so actually thinking, this is obviously from software, I think it absolutely applies to solving legal problems. I actually think about three or four or five different ways of solving a problem. Why don't you listen to the really quiet person in the room about their way of solving the problem? Why don't you listen to the junior person, the junior lawyer, um, whilst they're thinking about solving, because everyone comes at it from different ways, thinks about things in different ways, they are their characteristics, and instead of trying to turn everyone into a one-size-fit-all, we should be utilising all those different, those, those different things to solve problems and think through problems. Completely agree, and, and that's why you need to recruit different types of people, because if you recruit the same type of people, you won't allow for different, different ways of thinking, and we've seen, so Alex has done... So this is a, a snapshot in the hub when we got um, students thinking, thinking through a, 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 um, a certain challenge around, um, around a certain, certain topic. And um, when, we, when we've done it in the past with lawyers, it's been very different when we've yeah. mixed it to a, a, to a diverse group of students. And the outcomes, you then have people mapping things up in graphs and you know, thinking more stats and numbers and someone more thinking around the actual, the actual context and, and, and the actual sort of, I suppose, more theory behind things. So it's really interesting when you get that mix of diversity. And as Alex says, you know, some people might be more introverts, but, um, but listening to others and actually getting, getting their opinions is, is so, so useful actually to come into a, to a really strong solution. Cool. Um, and another one, which is my, one of my big 
pet peeves about legal, and I've been going on for about a decade about this, is law seems to, be, seem to become, I think become or is, I don't know, I think it was more visual originally, but now is, is the last 20 years has become very word-based. So lots of words, long memos, research notes, um, people explaining all the where, where for all of every single possible option and scenario in a long document. And what clients want is outcomes. So generally, one of the complaints you hear about law firms and their outputs is often, I have to read four pages before I get to what am I supposed to be doing. And by the way, the rest of my business doesn't give a damn about the four pages. They want three bullet points on a slide saying, what are we going to do? So having a think about how you deliver things, um, even in the word area, um, you can do things very, very visual as people starting to do visual contracts. We are potentially doing something with someone soon which we're going to call cartoon contracts, which is basically trying to describe a contract as if it were a cartoon as opposed to 45 pages. Um, but also one of our GCs said, well, she really is a visual person. And so she just wants it explained in a flowchart. Tell me what my options are. Explain it in a flowchart. I don't get the words. I don't un read them. I'm a visual person. So trying to bring visual back into legal, both in terms of how you describe things, how you draw, think through things, and how you deliver them. So the famous one at the moment is um, M&A's deals, uh, um, due diligence, it usually gets delivered in a 142-page document with some tables in it saying these are the clauses you might need to look out for. And most of our GCs are saying, no, I just want, I want to know the risks. Show me pie charts. Show me visuals of that. Show me how I can drill into the information um, and deliver that in a way that we can use. If you ever work in a corporate, corporates spend a lot of time in PowerPoints with pyramids and diagrams, etc. There are no words. <laughs> um, there was, you're lucky sometimes if you get figures, but um, there are no words. So actually being able to talk in your, your client's language, which is a lot more visual. And I actually think you shouldn't crush visual thinkers. You know, there are still going to be word people, but they're also very visual people and bring the best out of those visual people. Yeah, completely agree. And we were also, Alex and I in the taxi over here, we're talking around meetings and how meetings run. So, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're pitching, let's just say, to a client or you're, or you're speaking to a client around an update on an existing matter, whether, again, it just all needs to be verbal or whether you could, you could use different types of ways of, of providing updates or pitching, not just going for the simple, here's a long document or let's just talk things through and... You know, is, is there a different creative way of actually getting points across in, in a very quick and concise way? And sometimes visually is, is, is a really useful way to do that. Everyone can see quite quickly on, on a graph or a chart what, what, what's what. What's what. And, and, I, and I, I completely yeah. agree when we actually look at changing and getting people to think about this a bit more. Um, it's also quite enjoyable and people get really into it, but it also they come to quite quick quite quick solutions sometimes. Um, and then this one, I think Chloe sort of touched on it, we'll, we'll stick on it a little bit, but actually bringing together these different backgrounds. Um, and, you know, as we start to go, I'm sure you've probably had some tech things today, there might be a tech thing at some point. How do you start to think about if you're going to do machine learning on an AI system? I'm an arts graduate, I still struggle, I can't code. I really can't, I'm too old now to, I think, to, to work it out, but my brain doesn't necessarily work that way. Um, so I actually kind of spend time with people who have those skills. And I can explain something a bit visually, but then it's someone else thinks on a slightly different approach about the data or the analytics, etc. cetera. Um, so we've really kind of worked to diversify out the people we're looking for. Um, and we're not looking for lawyers who code. What we're looking for is sets of skills. Um, you know, for, Chloe touched on it, the, um, the economic person, which is going to be absolutely <coughs> vital when we talk about financial services over the next 10 years and how we deliver um, financial services-based advice. Absolutely. And we've had some, you know, this has been really interesting. We actually did this exercise, the STEM one for Legal Cheek, which was we were the only law firm that didn't do a panel. Um, we basically gave everyone a scenario. We got them to, to run this, and they were fascinating. The outputs from the STEM people were when they were visual, they were models, they were thinking through the data model of what data was in the problem. We were actually trying to bring a bit more of the humanity side back in, go think about the person um, and what's the problem. But when we did this interestingly kind of sort of last minute um, with a bunch of humanities graduates, there was no visuals. <laughs> there was all like, how do we look in the contract and the words, etc. Um, so it was a two completely different sets of outcomes and I was really pushing them going, come on, there's a dashboard in there somewhere, there's a graph, there's a grid, something. Um, and it was really quite difficult. So, um, 
But it was fun, because actually what you do need is that balance. Um, but it was really interesting, the two different approaches. Um, and this stuff is actually quite good fun. Um, we always try to actually bring back some fun into these things. Um, you know, actually service design and the agile approach is actually, it's about listening to people, playing off people, having a bit of fun. It isn't sat at a desk, um, you know, staring at your screen for another 12 hours. Um, so as you can see, you know, these are some of the feedback we had from one of our sessions. Um, that actually, if you kind of think about doing stuff differently, you actually engage people. Yeah. And I think having an engaged workforce is something we really need to have. We need to have people who want to stay at the firm. We want the people who want to advocate the firm. We want people who are going to go in, have some comments, and say how great it is working at Reed Smith. And mm. that's the kind of stuff we really need to engage people with by actually make, giving them time to think differently rather than spending one whole week working on a 400-page contract because I don't think that's the future of law. Um, and... So I'm going to pass over to Chloe just on kind of like on the last, you know, sort of where we're starting to go um, with this kind of future lawyer. Because uh, my, my, we, can, we can try and think about what this might be in a few years' time, you know, the lawyer who codes, who's got an analytics degree and statistics and all this kind of stuff. But actually, we don't know. I'll be perfectly frank. We don't know. We're on a journey um, to that. Um, but what we're really thinking about is skills. Yeah. And with that... As Alex said, we don't know what it's going to be. So if we're asked, oh, what type of roles are, we, are there going to be for lawyers? We don't know yet because it could change down the line. But what we are trying to do is give people coming through, so future trainees included, and trainees the breadth in, in being able to get involved in other things outside of the role of a typical trainee moving around just the fee earning department. So we're looking, for example, as of this year, to open up our VAC scheme to have a couple of innovation seats. So you do two seats on our VAC scheme, um, so you could go, for example, into media and shipping. But we're, we're now actually looking to have a, an, a week innovation seat, so actually to look at some, some of the innovation around the firm, whether that be in a certain practice area, so yeah. looking in media if there's any ways that you, we, could in, we could be doing things differently, or whether it be to sit more with Alex and the knowledge manage, management team to see if there's anything that could be that could be improved there. So really interesting that we'll be able to have even that opportunity. We're also looking to also have something a bit similar on our training contract. So potentially looking at having a seat where you might go and sit in finance, but within that seat, you'll also be working on the innovation side to see the processes generally for getting things done in that team and whether there's any different types, whether it be technology, different ways of modelling things, different ways of solving problems, etc. and working with yeah. Alex and, again, the knowledge man management team and the wider finance group to see you know, what's, what, what could be improved, which is really exciting um, because it also gives people who really like that side of things the opportunity to diversify their role as well. So being able to do different types of things in your, in your role as a lawyer, you, you'd still be a lawyer and it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't sit outside yeah. and be me or Alex as a non-lawyer. Um, but it would also be there to look at some of the wider innovation in the firm and how you could really get involved and drive that, which is really exciting. So there are a couple of the yeah. things that we're looking at, and obviously recruitment with that is really key. You know, we've got, as I said, the first person we've ever interviewed soon coming through from a computer science background, which is something we just haven't seen in the past, um, which is really interesting. So yeah. We, we, yeah, to, I suppose to, to move things forward and to actually have the ability to have someone who has that technical expertise we need to ensure now yep. that we're starting to recruit. But um, yeah, if there's any other queries that are sort of, or, or questions, yep. you know, feel, free, feel free to ask us. And I think, yeah, no, I think there's that the internship we did last year was really interesting because what we're seeing is that lawyers are, are, you know, spend a lot of time dealing with other lawyers and obviously that's the, that's the commerciality and the, the comments we currently do with in-house and in-house are absolutely key to us. But actually our lawyers should be consulting the people building things. So you talked about, I think the one before was about Facebook and designing the Facebook system and all this kind of stuff. A lawyer would probably have signed that off at the end of the development of that let's haunt and creep people algorithm that got built. Why aren't lawyers at the beginning of that whilst the thing's actually being designed? Why aren't they standing up in the stand-up teams um, with the development teams on a weekly basis and actually being part of that team and embedding in... Um, that legal ethics type into, the, into there rather than being, oh, this, the legal have signed it off. And that's going to become it really, really critical. Well, I'm going to leave you with one real thought. Um, we talk about diversity a lot, and, and I've been sh struck by when I came into Reed Smith how much they genuinely, absolutely, 100% care about diversity. Um, I, 
I think there's a very big issue coming up, potentially for society, in that most of the computers and the algorithms and the AI is being coded by men. <laughs> okay? So actually, we need to find ways, even if we're not going to find 50-50 female coders, male coders, whatever it might be, we need to have people and diversity in those teams that are start to do this. Otherwise, we're going to start to make ourselves a very, very big hole. And we're already starting to see that. Um, and I think people who have these multiple functional skills have the legal skills, have the ethics skills, but also have the ability to be on a stand-up team in a product development team or working with a bank innovation hub or working with Facebook or MIT or whatever it is, those people are going to be absolutely critical because that's going to be where lawyers will be probably in 20 years' time. They won't be sat in an office in the GC team. They will be part of development teams. They will be in the business, etc. And so we need to make sure our lawyers are ready for that because it's not going to be spending time with other GCs, a you know, lawyer GC having a nice chat about you know, where they used to study or whatever it might be. It's going to be actually those people are going to have to have these skills and communicate and inter, inter work with diverse teams um, and, and people who aren't lawyers. Um, so as non-lawyers, you'll have to work with us. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, are there any questions? I think that's We've got some online, okay. but yes, do we have one in the room? We'll do one from online and one from the room. So So, so, my, so my view. So I'm just going to repeat it for the Sorry. online people. Sure. So the question was, um, do all lawyers need to code? So, so my viewpoint on that is, you need principles, and I think doing code is a good way of earning, learning the principles of computers, and they are amazing because, strangely, you have to be logical, otherwise the computer program doesn't run. So, actually, the sk I would look to the skills that you learn from that and then apply that into law rather than you're going to be spending most of your life coding your own algorithm to look at your M&A deal or whatever it might be. The principles that you get from that are clear, but they could equally be got from economics analysis or statistical analysis somewhere else. Um, you're not going to, I don't think, my viewpoint is that actually the apps and the tools are starting to go to no code. I did a presentation recently on no code products, as in you're just going to drag and drop a flowchart. So you won't have to code a flowchart but you need to know how to build a flowchart and it be to be logical. So I have no problem with, we will take someone and there will be lots of opportunities to do stuff, but it is not core, personally. That's my personal view. I get quite head up about it. Well, I think one of the messages that's come across as well is that, as Chloe said, we don't know the future. So it's yeah. very much about showing a willingness. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's part of moving towards showing a willingness. Yeah, absolutely. Because right, we're going to have to adapt as things change. So just one question from online. Um, how can an applicant demonstrate innovation in an interview or, or in an application? How can they show they're innovative? Good question. Um, I think, to the lady's point, actually seeking out different opportunities outside of the norm is definitely one. So attending different seminars, building up your knowledge and just the understanding. It's the same of how do you show commercial commercial awareness, which is always the buzz term, which obviously you would have all heard at some point. Um, but to do that, you need to understand really what, you, what, what you're looking at and what employers are seeking. So what is a law firm looking when they mean, in, mean commercial awareness? They're looking at you to understand how a business just operates and the wider goings on in the world and how that incorporates to law with innovation understanding what the challenges might be yeah. how things may change or may not change we don't know as we said um, but just actually understanding some of these principles and concepts but also trying to challenge yourself to get new yeah. different skills because that's ultimately what we're saying we need um, so I think you know showing that you've actually I suppose sought out these different opportunities understand the challenges I think for me that would be good Okay, thank you very much. And I think one good message that comes from that is that, oh, sorry, we haven't got time. We're already run 10 minutes behind. Um, I'm, I'm sure you'll stick around for a bit. Yep. But I think one of the great things to take from that for those who are kind of sitting there going, ah, robots, ah, which I don't really like as a concept. Anyway, but the, uh, <laughs> people process technology, people first, human skills. Um, so thank you very much, guys, thank for coming up. Thank you. And I'd just say, sorry, if anyone wants to follow up with us after, I know there might have been a couple of questions, it's Chloe Muir and Alex Smith, so feel free to link up with us on LinkedIn. Or Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs>